you know, go into the fact that that also means they're your least favorite, it's but we'll just stick true. with <laughs> that they're your favorite that's by true. default. Yeah. Where's Caitlin always says, I hope you're pronouncing that wrong. It's grandchild. Favorite grandchild. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Time to get started. Uh, don't forget that uh, we have a new brother in Christ, Derek Delucia. Um, hopefully we'll get to see him here pretty soon. We talked about kids' class this morning. I don't think anyone here has four to eight-year-old kids. Um, we got one that's four months. <laughs> Get Wayne and Diana. We'll know more about Wayne's condition uh, tomorrow. And I see the Levi's were picked up, so somebody got those. And uh, we need to add Jessica to your prayer list. She's just been getting too hot up to where she's working. She's not feeling good tonight at all, I guess. Nancy said she's dizzy and not feeling good. So keep praying for Jessica. Jeff, you ready to sing? I am. You're up. <laughs> it's on the board. <laughs> 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 Please open your songbooks to number 744. 744.
27, 9 through 7. Good evening, 
everyone. It is a blessing to see all of you back here again today for the second time for most of us and for the first time for some of us, but we are very happy that we are able to worship here in safety and in comfort again and learn more about our Lord and his word. Um, we're going to be continuing as we preach through the Bible here, and we are still in 1 Samuel. Now, last week we left off in the beginning of chapter 5, so go ahead and be turning to 1 Samuel chapter 5, and we'll be, uh, Lord willing, going through about chapters 5 and 6 this evening. As Again, we're picking out um, learnings that we can get from what was written long ago, right? That's Paul writing in Romans 15 verse 4 that the things that were written long ago were written for our understanding. And that's exactly what we're doing is we're looking at these things written thousands of years ago and learning from them. Because like we talked about in the morning several times, God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And believe it or not, humans don't change either. Solomon, pretty wise man, happened to note that in the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, that everything is cyclical, that what was once old will now be new again, and that there will be a, a time for everything. There is nothing new under the sun. So as we're learning a little bit more about God and us interacting with him, we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 5. And just as a reminder, this is right after uh, we've, we've been introduced to Eli and to his two wicked sons. And Eli was the reigning high priest and acting judge in Israel. And in one day to punish the family of Eli for all of the wicked that he allowed his sons to be doing, both of Eli's sons died in a single day. Eli himself died. The ark was captured by the Philistines, who the Israelites were fighting against. So we're going to be picking it up here after the Philistines have captured the ark of the covenant. And they have taken it in chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now, Philistia, uh, along in that, in that Gaza Strip by Israel, right along the coast, there's famously five city-states, uh, the five lords of the Philistines. And those five sections were Ashdod, Ekron, Ashkelon, Gath, and Gaza. Those were the five sections that the Philistines owned that the Jews should have conquered when Joshua was leading the conquest of the land and they never got around to doing it. And because of the Jews' lack of faith in conquering this land, God said, now I'm not going to let you ever kick the Philistines out. They're going to be a thorn in your side, and I'm going to use them as a tool to punish you whenever you're not doing what you should be doing. This happened to be in a long stretch of years that Israel was not doing what they were supposed to be doing. So Philistia was constantly rising against them. God was allowing them to torment Israel like they did when they slew 30,000 of their men and captured the ark. Then they brought the ark to Ashdod. Verse 2, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And that was their chief deity. And what we know about Dagon is that he was uh, obviously an idol, not a real god, but he was in the form of a merman. So he had the torso of a man um, and then the lower half tail of a fish. And that's what Dagon looked like. Uh, in verse 3, when the Ashdodites arose early in the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. So in the night, God has tipped over this statue, this carving of Dagon, so that he is face down, praising the ark of the covenant, bowing before God. Uh, so the Philistines, oh, well, that was, that was very silly, Dagon. Here, let me set you back up on your place, mighty God that we follow. But verse 4, when they rose again the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord again. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Now, we had kind of mentioned this before, but the fact that Dagon is a half-man, half-sea creature type god means that he has the human upper half. So he has a human head. He has human hands. And it's very telling to us that when God tips him over again this time to bow down before him, God removes off his head and his hands before him. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as the Lord is speaking amongst himself, saying, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. That is one of the ways that we are made like God and no other animal is. We have these hands that are unique in nature. Our feet, our heads. 
And we see throughout the Bible that God prizes his form. Even when somebody evil like Jezebel in 2 Kings 9, verse 35, gets thrown out of a window and dies, the most evil woman in probably all of Israelite history, the dogs come up and start eating her corpse. And when the people come out to go bury the remains of the queen, all that's left are her head, her hands, and her feet. And that's very intentional, obviously, because again, these came from God, and God prizes them. And that's something that we should look at is, do we respect our hands and feet and our head and the fact that we are made in God's image? Do we think about that throughout the day? And as we're talking to other people, do we always remember that they are made in God's image as well and knit together by the Lord God himself in their mother's womb? Just things for us to be thinking about, even as we're reading this little account of Dagon falling over and having some pieces of him break off. Uh, verse 5, then we see the interesting um, myth that's, that's, that spawns from this, uh, from this culture. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor all who enter Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So the priests were like, oh man, that threshold must have been bad luck. Look, his hands and his, and his head both popped off when he hit that threshold. That must be really bad luck. So here we already kind of see the first tellings of there's something strange happening. And what I want us to be looking at as we continue through this account, how slow humans are to change their opinion of things. How much more willing we are to chalk things up to blind luck or to chance than to realize that God is giving us signals, that he is telling us something. And again, how much quicker sometimes the enemies of God can do it than God's own people. As we're going through these sections tonight, I want us to keep the saying in mind that familiarity breeds contempt. That's a, a long-standing saying. It's not from the Bible, but it's the fact that the more time we spend with things, the more likely we are to devalue it in our eyes, that we don't always give it the honor or the precedence that it should because we get used to it. And that's something that we as Christians need to make sure we're never doing with God because we're so used to having him in our lives and the blessings that he brings, worshiping him. But we're going to see throughout this account that it's the enemies of God that have more honor for God than his own people because of that, because his people got too used to God. And we can't ever fall into that trap. All right, so we'll be continuing on here. Uh, now in verse 6. Now the hand of the Lord was very heavy on the Ashdodites, and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is severe on us and on Dagon our God. This is just such a funny statement to me, because remember what I had said about humans being slow to change our mind, change our position on things? Here these men are realizing, whoa, this God of the Israelites, he's inflicting us, and he's, in, he's afflicting our God with all of these problems. Then why is Dagon your God? Why are you even serving him? If there's a better God who's clearly rubbing your God's face in the dirt, why aren't you serving that one? Why are you still stuck with Dagon then? But how often do humans do this? How often do we conform to the cultural norms or the traditions of our family, even in the face of blatant, obvious evidence like this? This is something, again, that we should be aware of in our lives and say, you know, should I be doing something different right now? What's making me continue to do this, this uh these choices in life that haven't been working. Is it the culture? Is it some other thing that's causing me to do this? Because if I look at the situation critically, I realize, wow, this is really stupid for me to keep serving Dagon. If Israel's God is clearly more powerful than him, follow-up question, why are the Philistines still attacking Israel? If this is what their God can do, a, we should serve the more powerful God anyway. B, we're really probably making him mad by attacking his people. So these are all things that they could have been doing, but that's not the choice that they decide to make. So in verse 8, here's what they do. They sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines, all five of them, and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they said, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath, one of the other territories. And they brought the ark of, um, uh, the ark of God of Israel around. After they had brought it around, 
um, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great confusion. And he smote the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. Broke out on them, excuse me. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron, to a third city. And the ark of God came to Ekron. The Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel around us to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of God of Israel and let it return to its own place, so that it will not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly confusion throughout the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were smitten with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Again, we need to focus on the fact that they are ignoring the obvious here of, hey, why don't we start serving this God? Why don't we start becoming like the Jews? Because clearly, he's stronger than all of the gods that we're praying to to protect us from him. And this is something that we hear about in the New Testament as well. So if you want to stick a finger there, let's jump over to 1 Corinthians. And we are going to be looking at what Paul is writing about why people are resistant to understanding these spiritual truths. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is where we're going to. And we're going to look first at verse 18. Then we're going to be jumping uh, forward a little bit to chapter 2, verse 14. Chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And now let's jump to chapter 2, verse 14. And we're going to read a little bit more about why this is foolishness to other people who aren't spiritually minded. Verse 14, chapter 2, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. So what should we take away from this? is that if we're looking at five different cities and all of these lords of the Philistines, smart guys, powerful guys, and they're like, oh man, the Ark of the Covenant is nuking one of these cities. We better move it to another one. Oh, it's the same thing happened there. We better move it to a third one. We better just keep moving it to all of our people so they all keep getting afflicted instead of accepting that God is the true God, accepting that you need to worship him and you need to ally with his people Israel instead of doing all of that which seems so obvious the people of the world just can't grasp these spiritual truths do we think that that will be any different as we're sharing the message of the cross with people really do we think that will be any different these people were being afflicted by confusion and tumors and mice overrunning their city as soon as the ark got there and they still were like oh better try another city None of the people we're talking to are probably going to be getting afflicted by confusion and mice and tumors as we're trying to tell them about Jesus. That doesn't mean that we should stop or lose hope. It just means we should expect that most people are not going to accept it. Look at how desperate these guys were to take any other option other than their God is the true God and ours are not. This demonstrates to us how stubborn humans can be, even in the face of mortal peril and a lot of discomfort. That still doesn't mean that we should give up. It just means that we need to be aware of this. And we looked at the parable of the sower and the soils that Jesus gave us to tell us about that, that most of the soils we're going to be scattering our seed to are going to reject it. They're not going to grow a plant of faith. But we need to be looking for the one soil that does, and then it will find other soils that does, that continually accept it and grow these plants of faith. So just something for us to be looking at because we are still the same beings we were 3,000 years ago. All right, well now continuing on into chapter 6. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines seven months. Seven months! People had been dying, being getting smoked by God, getting tumors that appeared overnight. Mice were overrunning their country. And for seven months, the Philistines endured that because they didn't want to admit that this God, not the one they chose, but this other God, was the true God. It's amazing how stubborn we can be. Verse 2, And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we shall send it away to its place. They said, if you send the ark of God, or send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but you shall surely return to him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, what shall the guilt offering which we shall return to him be? 
And they said, five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, one for each plague that was on you and on all of your lords. So you shall make these likenesses of your tumors and the likenesses of your mice that ravage your land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will ease his hand from you, your God, and your land. I'm trying to decide if I want to go into the next verse or not, or we'll save it. But we're just going to go ahead and read uh, verse 6. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he, God, had severely dealt with them, did they not allow the people to go, and then they departed? These guys are even learning better than God's people. First of all, they're looking at what's going on. They're seeing this physical calamity and realizing this has a spiritual cause. We need to look inwardly and seek spiritual advice. You know who didn't do that? God's own people. In chapter 4, let's flip back a page or so. Um, the Philistines march out and they fight against the Israelites for the first time. In verse 2 uh, of chapter 4, the Philistines drew up in battle array to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? That's good. That question right there is good. If you're asking it to God. If you want the actual answer. But instead, did they even ask that question? They're asking themselves. Their solution let us take for ourselves from Shiloh the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, that it may come along with us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. They're starting to ask the question, but they don't actually want the answer. They're not even talking to the real God that they have. They have a high priest who has the ephod that he can wear or hold. He can hold the Urim and Thurim stone. He can ask God directly what is going on, and God would have told them, it's because of your faithlessness, Philistine, or Philistia is continually winning. I'm causing them to win. But they don't ask. These Philistines, these pagans, they're asking their sorcerers and diviners and the leaders of their worship. And they are looking at the livers of animals or rolling the bones or whatever they're doing to try and get these answers. But God is still manipulating all of those things to get the right answers. At least they're asking spiritual questions to spiritual sources instead of just making assumptions of, well, we want to beat Philistia, so let's just go get the ark and we'll get it. We don't actually care why we're not succeeding. We just want to succeed. This goes back to our thesis statement of familiarity breeds contempt. The Israelites have gotten so used to thinking that God just blesses them all the time that they can't even conceive that it might be God who's stopping them from success in their life. So they're chalking it up to bad luck. They're chalking it up to any random thing. Oh, well, we just weren't prepared enough. We didn't have enough of God on our side. So let's go get some more God on our side. We're not going to follow his directions for doing so, but we're going to do it our way. At least the Philistines are legitimately asking whatever gods they think they're asking, and God is directing them to give the ark back uh, through however they're actually asking these questions. This is something that we as Christians need to take a note of. If we're running into something in our lives, if we're feeling like the world is against us, if we can't make any headway, are we looking inwardly at our lives? Are we actually asking the question? Are we praying to God and trying to see, is there sin in my life? Is this just a trial or a temptation that I need to overcome? Or is there something God is trying to draw my attention to? And beyond that, are we looking into the scriptures to see what God's directions are for us, or if that's what's going to show us what's wrong in our life? Um, it's amazing to me that the Philistines are more willing to do this than the Jews, but this is nothing new. In fact, in the New Testament, if we go to Acts chapter 17, we're going to see that people have always done this. Believers in God have always done this. And we are, as Christians, warned against it. In Acts chapter 17, we're going to be looking at Paul as he goes to visit the Berean Jews. Now, he has just left Thessalonica, and he's talked to the Thessalonican Jews. He tried to go into their synagogue, reason with them, and show them that Jesus was the Messiah. He did that for three weeks before they ran him out of town, because they didn't want to accept the truth. But what is it that the Berean Jews do? 
In Acts 17, starting in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word of God with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. They're examining the scriptures to see if what they're being told lines up with what God has already said. And this is what we as Christians should always be doing as well. None of you should ever be taking my opinion or <laughs> advice or my statements for anything unless it's backed up by scripture. And that doesn't mean just me. It means anyone who is giving you the idea of, hey, you know, we should worship God by doing da 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 Okay, well, anything that has to do with God needs to be coming out of his word, or we're not listening to you, because it's only God's word that matters. And we always have to be willing to go and ask God and look for his directions, unlike the Jews, and at least like the Philistines, even if they're going about it the wrong way. They have the right inclination. We cannot ever become so familiar with God that we refuse to, to look for his answers. All right, so as the Philistines now have this plan, um, they're going to send this Ark of the Covenant back to the Jews. And this statement in verse 6 that I hesitated about reading, but I read it anyway, because we're just going to go into it. Why then do you harden your heart as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had severely dealt with them, did they not then allow the people to go and they departed? This happened hundreds of years ago in a different country. And the Philistines, who weren't involved in any way, they learned from this better than the Jews. And this goes back to what God has said about him always being honored, regardless of what the Jews were doing. If you want to stick a finger there and go back to uh, Deuteronomy, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy, we're just going to look at four verses here. We're going to look at God saying, when you guys are obeying me, I'm going to be honored, basically, by how many blessings you're getting. And when you guys are disobeying me, I, God, am still going to be honored by how badly I'm going to punish you. In either case, God will always be honored. So in Deuteronomy chapter 28, let's look at the first verse here. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And if we drop down to verse 10, therefore all of the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. They are going to be honoring God because of the indestructibility he's going to be giving you guys, the blessings he's going to be showering on you guys. Maybe if the Philistines had seen that, seen Israel not being defeated in anything, them being blessed, leaving their house, coming back into their house, maybe they would have been more willing to, look, to worship the God of Israel. But as it stands, verse 15, But it shall come about, if you do not obey the Lord your God, to observe all his commandments and his statutes, which I charge upon you today, so now disobedience, all of these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And it's basically cursing them the exact opposite of everything God said he was going to bless them with. And if we go to chapter 29, um, verses 24 and 25, we see the wrap-up of what the result of all of these cursings will be. Then all of the nations will say, why has the Lord God done this to this land? Why this great outburst of anger? Then men will say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom he had not allotted to them. Therefore the anger of the Lord burned against that land to bring upon it every curse which is written in this book. God will always be honored, sometimes in how much he blesses the lives of his followers, and sometimes in how much he destroys the lives of his disobedient followers who aren't doing the right thing, but are very, they, they are bringing shame and blasphemy to his name. The entire world will see that God always is the one who's actually acting. Whether they act on it, like these Philistines refusing to act on it, that's a different story. 
but they will still all see it, and God will be glorified either way. And it's just amazing that, again, these are the enemies of God remembering what God did to another people that they weren't even involved with. But we don't ever see the Israelites saying this same thing. So are we making sure that we're always looking back to, have I seen an example of this in the Bible? What should I be doing? Has God given me an example of what to do in this circumstance or this situation? Because the Israelites didn't, and they were continually destroyed for it. This is why God says in Hosea that my people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Because if we don't know the Bible, and God tries to get our attention, but we don't know it, God's going to continually keep trying to get our attention in negative ways. More bad things are going to keep happening to us, and we're never going to learn. We will be destroyed because of our lack of knowledge. All right, so let's continue on here. Verse 7. Uh, the Philistines then take uh, a new cart and two milch cows, which have never been yoked before, and they set the ark of the Lord on this cart. And they send it, and they, they're even trying to give a test for themselves. And they say, watch. If it goes up to its own territory, in verse 8, to Beth Shemesh, then he, God, has done us this great evil. But if not, we will know that it was not his hand that struck us. It has happened to us by chance. Then the men did so, they took the two cows, they hitched to the, the cart, shut the calves up at home, they put the ark of the Lord on the cart with the box of the golden mice and the tumors. The cows took the straightaway in the direction of Beth Shemesh. They went along to the highway, lowing as they went, they did not turn aside to the right or to the left, and the lords of the Philistines followed them to the border of Beth Shemesh. God will continually give signs to those who are looking for them, if they are actually trying to seek him. Paul describes that even those who were searching around in the dark, God would allow himself to be found by them. Even if they grope and scraped in the dark, he would allow himself to be found. Those who knock, the door will be opened. Those who ask will, or those who seek will find. God will allow himself to be found by anybody. We still have to decide what we're going to do with it after we say, God, if you're real, please let this happen. And then if that happens, the ball's back in our court. What are we going to do about it? Because now the expectation has ticked up just a little bit more. Um, so then the Israelites, they see the ark coming uh, as it's the wheat harvest in the valley. They raised their eyes and they were glad to see the ark. Verse 13, the cart came to the field of Joshua, the Beth Shemite, and stood there while there was a large stone. They split the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Then the Levites came and took the ark of the Lord and the box that was with it, with the articles of gold, put them on the large stone. And the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrifice offerings to the Lord that day. Then the five lords of the Philistines saw it, and they returned to Ekron that same day. So that's the resolution. The ark has now gone back into Israel, and the Philistines, by their own words, know, yep, this was God that was thumping us for what we were doing, so we're just going to back away slowly. Again, is that going to change their behavior? No, because they keep attacking Israel. Even though they have clearly the bigger, stronger God, that doesn't stop them from doing what they want. Again, those are notes for us as we're trying to spread the gospel in this world. But we're just going to skip down to verse 19 and following of the rest of this chapter, and that's probably where we're going to wrap it up for today. But then he, God, struck down some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord he struck down the people, 50,070 men, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall go up for and to whom shall he go up from us? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirith Jerem, saying, The Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord, come down and take it up with you. Why didn't God strike down the Philistines for looking at the Ark of the Covenant. Have you ever thought about that before? As the, the Jews send the Ark, we're all very aware, uh, most of us are probably aware of the account of Uzzah, who's walking next to the Ark on this cart, and then the oxen stumble, and it's about to fall off. So he reaches out a hand to touch it, and God strikes him dead right then and there. Do we not think that the Philistines put their grubby little paws all over the Ark as well? You don't think they took the lid off and looked at what was inside? Man, what's in this holy box that the Jews have? And all of them were staring at it and praising it and putting it in the house of Dagon. Why didn't they die? 
Let's go to Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. This is one of the more important things that we're going to be talking about. Because this is something that is present in the entire Bible, uh, as we're talking about it right here. But it's no different for us today. Luke chapter 12 verses 47 and 48. In, I'm just going to give the background of this. Jesus is giving a parable, and what he's talking about is a slave who's left in charge of his master's household, and he's the one who needs to decide what stuff gets done while the master goes away on a trip. And one slave does really good, and in another example, one does not. So in verse 47, um, Jesus is talking about the slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will, that slave will receive many lashes as punishment for not doing the right thing. Verse 48, but to the slave who did not know his master's will and committed deeds worthy of a flogging, he will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Were the Philistines being punished for keeping the Ark of God? Yes, they were. The tumors, the mice, the confusion, the death, it was happening. But they were being beaten with less stripes, less blows by God, because they were doing things worthy of a beating, but they didn't know that they were doing things worthy of a beating. However, the Jews knew. Let's look at Numbers chapter 4, verses 5, 15, and 20. Numbers chapter 4, about what the Jews had been told. They had it written down for them. Their priests knew this and should have been instructing people in what God had said here. Numbers chapter 4, verse 5. When the camp sets out, here was God's direction for moving the ark. Aaron and his sons shall go in to the tabernacle. They shall spread over the ark of the covenant, um, Oh, sorry, they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the Ark of the Testimony with it. Then they shall lay a covering of porpoise skin on it and shall set over a cloth of pure blue and shall insert its poles. Drop down to verse 10. And they shall put all of the utensils in a covering of porpoise skin and they shall carry it on its carrying bars. And then verse 15. When Aaron and his sons have finished covering all of the holy objects and the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after that, then the sons of Kohath can come in and carry them, so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things in the tent of meeting which the sons of Kohath are to carry. God had told the Jews, don't touch any of the ark of the utensils, only Aaron and his sons, so the high priest and the other priests can touch those things when it's time to move out. And then only the Kohathites, another tribe of Levi, can carry them. If you touch them or even look at them, you will die. The Jews' knowledge had been increased. Therefore, their expectation had increased. All of these men of Beth Shemesh who came over and gawked at the ark, like, oh man, I've heard about it, but I never got to see it before, looked at it or touched it. God killed 50,000 of them because he does not play favorites with the rules. Our God is a God of justice, Isaiah 30, verse 18. He does not bend the rules. He tells us what the outcome will be and lets us choose what outcome we want to receive from him. And those of us who know more, like all of us sitting in this room, we know more. Our expectations are higher. All of the Americans in this country who have access to Bibles for free on their phone in a language that they can understand, where no one is persecuting them for reading it, we have a higher expectation as a nation. This entire world, the expectation has gone up. But this is why it's so important for us to spread the gospel and spread it correctly, is because the expectation of this world, of the blessings that we have in this time and place, are just continuing to go up. Therefore, as our ability and resources has gone up, our expectation rises as well. Thank you very much for your good attention. Um, we're going to be standing to sing this song, and this is the invitation song. So the reason that we call it that is because we invite anybody who has any needs, whether that's to put on Christ through baptism for the first time in your life, 
Or, if you have other needs for prayers or for anything else the congregation can do, we invite you to come down. I'm going to be standing right here. You can catch me, tell me whatever your need is as we prepare to stand and sing as Jim leads us. Father in heaven, we come before you at this time just thanking you so much for Jesus and his willingness to come to earth and live as a man and to give up something in heaven that he, for us. And Father, we just ask that as we partake of this bread, we remember the sacrifices that he made, remember that it represents his body, Father, that hung on the cross for us. Help us to partake of this in a way that is pleasing and acceptable to you. Father in heaven, we continue our thanks unto you for the Spirit of the Vine, which to us as Christians represents Christ's shed blood that can wash us clean, Father. And Father, we just ask you to, to bless the Spirit of the Vine and, and bless those who partake of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege we have to come together here and learn more about you and fellowship with one another. And Father, we just ask that all we did and said here this evening will be in accordance with your will and, and glorify you. Father, be with all those who are mentioned who are needing, needing our prayers and needing your help. And be thy will, Father, just heal them quickly. Especially be with Jessica and Diana and, and 
waiting, Father, as they are facing crisis in their lives for sure. Father, just comfort them and, and, and heal them, Father. We just praise you that we can come to you in prayer and, and knowing that you hear our prayers. And Father, we know that you answer them in the best way for us. Father, we just ask you to go with us as we leave this place and, and watch over us and if be thy will, bring us back at the next point in time. As we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.